In this video, David Richardson from NCI is speaking at the second annual HVACR symposium on the topic of combustion air and specifically a lot of the myths that technicians believe about combustion air. I know these videos are a little longer, but you will definitely learn something if you watch this video. Big thanks to David and NCI for allowing us to share this with you on YouTube. So here we go, David Richardson talking about combustion air myths. Please join me in welcoming David Richardson. He's a trainer with NCI, and he loves HVAC. So give a round of applause to David. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. I, was, uh, I was being social, so sorry about that. Sometimes I, I drift and I start talking. So we're going to be talking about combustion air this morning. We're going to talk about some of the myths that go along with those and also how we can debunk those. So let me ask you guys a question. I'm going to address some sometimes they're uncomfortable things. It's like you pick up a rock and you find something real nasty and scary underneath it and instead of addressing it, you want to throw the rock back down real quick. So when we start talking about combustion air, I'm going to bring up some uncomfortable facts. And what I want you to do is don't take my word for it. What I want you to do is go out and measure and test and prove it to yourself. Does that sound like a plan? Is that fair enough? Because without measurements, all we have are opinions. So I want to make sure you guys are measuring. So that's my challenge and also my opportunity that I want to present you guys with is to measure this stuff. Now, if you don't test, you're just guessing. As John Ellis was pointed out yesterday, I, as he was presenting, I was sitting in the back and I see a lot of his slides and I'm going, oh, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. Oh, crap. I'm going to talk about that. So what you're going to hear is probably stuff that you already know. Now, I have the curse of being an SOB. Is anybody else in here an SOB? I was a son of boss. I was the kid that got stuck pushing on the pull door for about 10 minutes before I finally figured out, oh, it goes the wrong way. Whoops. So I found out that there's two types of bosses, sons. I was the one that it took a little bit of struggle and a little bit of work to learn something. So I present things from a very simplified standpoint, the way that I had to learn them. I wasn't blessed with the gift of intelligence. It takes me a lot of struggle, a lot of effort to learn something. So what I, my effort to do in this presentation is to break things down very simple. So if I insult anybody by breaking it down that simple, I want, to take the, I want to take it now to apologize to you. So I don't get super detailed on some things. So we find out sometimes in our industry we suffer what's called the curse of knowledge. We forget where we came from, and we talk and we use a whole lot of terms that are familiar with us, but everybody else looks at us just like we, you know, we don't understand what you're saying. It's because they don't. So I will try to break things down at a very simple level. Now, before I do get started, guys, the undertaking that Brian Orr and his team have put together here is incredible. If you haven't taken an opportunity to thank them, I would encourage you to do that. His staff, the event, to put on an event like this is incredible. And if the past year that we've had, we needed this. Our industry needed this. And my hat's off to Brian and his team for putting this together. He's got a little gal who works for him named Danielle. I gotta tell you, I appreciate what she does. She kept me in line on getting things in on time and gave me the butt kicking that I needed a lot of times to get that information in. So Daniel, wherever you are, thank you for that. And also the sponsors. They've made a significant investment for us to be here to improve ourselves. So with what we're gonna talk about this morning, here's my encouragement to you. Take one thing, take one thing out of this conference and do something with it immediately. This is an investment, not only in your time, but also in your education. Take something and do something with it, pick something and set a deadline for what you're gonna do with this. Now, on to combustion air. A lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about, you already know. What I wanna do is take the topic and I wanna shift it about 90 degrees. And I want you to look at it through a different set of lenses. And then I want you to measure to verify that combustion air is actually working. Because air is the key word in combustion air, it is air. And once you understand the principles of air, and then you start to tie it in with the principles of combustion. It makes a world of difference. And we make a lot of assumptions. Those of you that are in here now, how are you verifying that there's enough combustion air? What do you use? What tools? I heard a combustion analyzer. You rock, whoever said that, because that's your number one tool. Most of our industry uses a tape measure and a calculator combined with a code book. We're gonna talk about some assumptions that are made with that. 
and then how you guys can test to see if those assumptions are working or not. We're going to see some of the things that go along with that. So let's get into a preview of what we're going to talk about. So I didn't put numbers on this, so I apologize. So sometimes it may be a little hard to follow. But just as a preview of what we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about some code references first. We're going to talk about where they came from, that sort of thing. Some of the actual references, I'll give you the code numbers if you want to refer to them. And I referred to this out of the 2015 International Fuel Gas Code. After that, I want to talk about a research project that some engineers did for ASHRAE. And some of their findings are very interesting. They should cause all of us to ask why, and then the measure to figure out why. Then we're going to talk about what influences combustion air. There's a couple of different things. And I'm hoping at this point you guys are going, oh, oh yeah, we're getting this now. Not only are we going to talk about the influencers, we're going to talk about how they affect the most common combustion air installations that you guys may see. Beyond that, we're also going to talk about how to diagnose it. The test instruments that you need, we already kind of let one of them out of the bag with a combustion analyzer. There's a couple others that you're going to need, and you'll be able to determine if combustion air is performing. And I'm going to show you how to do that through test results. Now, once you find the combustion air problem, you also need to be able to fix it. So I will cover some very common solutions that you guys can use to fix combustion air problems. Because once you understand how air works, once you understand how combustion works, you can use those principles to fix some of these problems. And you're going to find out that the most complicated problems typically boil down to four rules that you can measure. But you have to understand them before you can take advantage of them. After we get through with those solutions, we'll wrap it up with questions and comments as we continue on. Now, the word debunk, it's kind of a funny word. You don't, you don't hear it a lot. It has to be from the South, because bunk is one of those words that means nonsense, something that's silly. And when you look at how we consider combustion air and what we assume happens, it really is bunk. It's nonsense. When you look at it through the lens of what happens with airflow, the properties, the physics that it follows, and we start to go, that's nonsense. So we got to debunk it. We debunk that through measurements not opinions. So I'm going to teach you guys in this session how we're going to expose some of the falsehoods of combustion air and then how to fix them as we go through this. How many of you guys are here with your dads? Anybody here as a father son? Excellent. That rocks. He's watching virtually. Excellent. Guys, it was an event just like this that changed the course of my career. Back in early 2000, I was on my way out of the HVAC industry. I thought about quitting. I got sick and tired of getting my butt kicked by low price. Sound familiar? My dad knew I was getting frustrated. I was young enough that I could get out and get it back into college, finish my degree, and figure out something else I wanted to do. He knew I was down. He said, why don't you go to this conference with me? We'd gone every year. It's called the Energy Management Conference in Louisville, Kentucky. At that conference, I met a gentleman named Rob Falk. He introduced me to something called Airflow. My life changed ever since. Five months after that, I met another fella. Little did I know that he would also change the course of my career. How many of you guys know these fellas up on the screen? You probably know who the guy in the middle is. He's the least important. There's two other guys up there that you need to know. Does anybody know these fellas? Because they are rich in combustion history. The guy with the cool haircut on the far right-hand side is Jim Davis. Not the guy that draws Garfield, but the daddy of modern-day combustion testing. Jim actually wrote the original books on combustion testing. Jim is the reason that I'm at NCI. When I met Jim, a lot of people think, oh, you just jumped on the bandwagon. I thought Jim was nuts when I first heard what he had to say. I was like, it can't be that bad. He made the same challenge to me that I made to you guys. Go test. Prove me right or prove me wrong. See what you find. And here I am, 20 years later, helping him write this stuff. Isn't that odd? So Jim is the guy that this, all, st all this stuff that I'm going to talk about comes from. None of this is from me. It's just stuff that I've done, tested, backed up. And it's physics. It's stuff that we know. Now, the other gentleman up there is Rudy Leatherman. He used to be with Backrack. Rudy is the one that said, you need to get into Jim's class. 2020 was a rough year. We lost Rudy in a farming accident. Rudy was the guy that 
his, his heart was as big as his laugh, guys. You probably all know somebody like that, and that was Rudy. He cared about the industry. He wanted to see it get better. We talked about some of the forefathers of our industry yesterday. Gentlemen these, and ladies, these are some of the forefathers of combustion. So I don't stand up here alone. I stand on their shoulders as I present this stuff to you. Now, they, asked, they influenced me in some major ways. And one of the biggest ways was to ask why. Why is something acting up? Why is this doing that? And not just to say because, but to be able to measure it. Because if you don't measure, if you don't have the data, you're just somebody else with an opinion. How many times have you gone in for a second opinion and somebody says, well, my brother's cousin's roommate said this, and he did HVAC for two weeks, and they'll take their opinion. Sound familiar? They're taking it as an opinion. When you measure, you change the game. You provide facts. You get data. Now, you have to take that data, and you have to translate it into something that makes sense. I'm a firm believer that once customers understand the words that are coming out of our mouths, they buy based on value. If they don't understand the words that are coming out of our mouth, they buy on price because that's the one thing that they understand. We gripe that customers always pay for the lowest price. It's because they don't understand us. It's because we are poor communicators. So as we go through this and we start to translate some of these combustion air things, you start to find these problems for your customers. Don't scare them. Present the facts just like a doctor would. Now, as we continue on with measurements and with data, it's important to understand that you don't want to walk into someplace dangerous. How many of you guys assumed in here that it was safe to breathe the air that's in this tent? <laughs> we all do, right? We don't think we're going to come to an HVAC event and get CO poison. Is anyone in here measuring ambient CO? Good. Some hands went up. Because a lot of us are out of town. Number one poisoning location. Look at there. Ty Brandman holding up a low-level personal monitor. Guys, that, don't ever assume what you're breathing. There have been a lot of guys that have been drug out of mechanical rooms unconscious because they assumed the air that they were breathing, that it was safe. Even though we're in an open tent, there's vehicles running around, there's generators, a lot of us are staying in hotels. Hotels are the number one most dangerous location for CO poisoning events. So as we talk about combustion air, your safety is number one. Your safety comes first. So monitor the places that you go into. Monitor the air. Now, with space testing, you need to be aware of this. A lot of guys will go in, they'll say, oh, you've got X amount of CO, this is your problem. You cannot pinpoint a CO problem with ambient CO testing alone. Ambient CO testing tells you that there's a problem. It doesn't tell you where. If you measure CO in a return duct or in a supply duct, it tells you that the blower and the equipment is circulating airflow. It doesn't indicate the source. So ambient CO is for your personal protection. Now, John Ellis went over this yesterday in his session. Some of the levels that you guys need to be aware of. Ideally, we should breathe zero parts per million of CO. Depending on the equipment that's inside the building, especially if you're dealing with gas ovens, you may measure some ambient CO. So at zero to nine parts per million, it's okay to test. You're not in harm's way yet, but you need to find out why. Why is there CO inside that space? Continue to test, figure out where it's at. It may be the oven that's been running and you just need ventilation. Or there may be a more deeper problem that you need to look into, such as we're gonna talk about this morning with combustion air. Now as you dig a little bit deeper and you get into 10 to 35, at that point, you need to start squirming a little bit. Start figuring out why. Zero parts per million is the only acceptable level from vented appliances. You should never have CO in the space from a vented piece of equipment. Because if you do, it's spilling. And you guys are gonna see, sometimes it can turn from a situation that may not look very bad into something that is extremely dangerous, like that. And I'd have never believed it when I first went through my first combustion class over 20 years ago and then I saw it happen. I'll share that with you shortly. Anything over 35? Anybody in here with the fire department? Any fire departments? What do you do over 35 parts per million, John? Test. Test? 
You're probably sticking something over your face, aren't you? Well, I've already got that on my face. You've already got it. Okay, so different fire departments have different, different standards. Usually 35 self-contained breathing apparatuses go on. So at that point in time, you need to start taking action. Ventilate that space. Get the air out. How many of you guys in here own blower doors? Anybody? There's a great alternative use for a blower door. Ventilate CO out of the space. Clear it out. Then you can go back in and test. And you need to test each appliance one at a time to figure out where the problem is at. We're going to get into equipment testing here shortly. Once you find it out, you either shut it down or repair it. So you don't turn everything on all at once. You don't want to put yourself in harm's way. Anything over 70 parts per million. At that point in time, you need to leave. You need to evacuate. Don't go in the house. Don't be a hero. Turn the equipment off. Open anything that you can. Turn the gas meter off if you have to or the propane tank. Get the customers out. You may need to call 911 at this point, depending on if anybody's showing any types of symptoms or anything. But before you do any type of testing, this is what you need to do. And this isn't, guys, this isn't just on equipment with fuel-fired equipment in it. This isn't on homes that just had gas or oil. This is any home. Because if you've got an all-electric home, what are some of the other potential sources that we may have to deal with that could make this an issue? I'll give you a hint. Everybody drove over here in one. Cars. Guys, I'm from central Kentucky. We just had a massive ice storm that went through, shut off power for a whole lot of people. There were a whole lot of generators running. They are also at the top of the list. A lot of times we get seal poison, we don't expect it. We go into survival mode, things happen. So make sure that you're monitoring. Don't get complacent as you walk in and you start to do these tests. So there's some health in instances that you can look at that are sometimes we mistake, such as allergies, chronic fatigue. Dig deeper whenever you see any of these lists. The most common misdiagnosed symptom of CO poisoning is fever. There have been people that have had fevers, gone to the doctor, been misdiagnosed, sent home. They died that night because they got poisoned again. So fever is the most misdiagnosed symptom of CO poisoning. And if you look at the list, if you guys want it, you can email me. My, my contact information should be available. I'll send you the whole list. It's like a page long. And when you read it, you're going to go, it describes everybody I know. That's me. More than likely, all of us have been poisoned at some point in time. Any smokers in here? It's okay if you admit it. CO, get this, CO actually increases your memory. So hot box one and you'll be smarter. Now on the flip side of that, flip side of that, how many of you, if you were smoking young, remembered the first time you smoked too much? You got real sick feeling. You got CO poison. After about four hours or so, you start feeling a little bit better. CO has a half-life of about four hours in your bloodstream. The, carb the hemoglobin in your blood is a junkie for carbon monoxide. It bonds, carbon monoxide bonds with hemoglobin 250 times easier than oxygen. So basically, you are asphyxiated from the inside out. That's the danger of it. John mentioned yesterday the dangers of long-term low-level poisoning. That is why it is so deadly, because you're being poisoned consistently, and you don't know it. Sometimes it's environmental. You may feel great when you go into a location. You leave, and all of a sudden, you're feeling worse. So sometimes it's not that you hate your house or you hate going to work. It may be that you're being poisoned while you're there. So if you're not measuring, you're just guessing. So as we get into this, I wanted to take a little bit of knowledge up front and help you guys just emphasize again, reemphasize the importance of combustion air. Now, the standards for our industry, when we look at fuel gas codes, I took all this information that I'm going to present to you guys for this first little, little bit out of the 2015 International Fuel Gas Code. I made up a table of all the different uh, listings of stuff, and I also want to talk about an ASHRAE journal report from over 20 years ago. And you guys can download this on the internet. These guys found some very interesting results as they went through it. Now, as far as code goes, there's numbers. We've got to consider where the location for the air for combustion is coming. Now, where should combustion air go? If you've got fuel-fired equipment, let's just say we've got a standard water heater, and furnace installation. Where does the combustion air need to go? What needs the combustion air? I know this sounds super simple. The flame, the burner. The burner needs oxygen. It doesn't need the nitrogen. The nitrogen is actually useless in the combustion process. It needs oxygen. So with the assumptions that are being made here is that if we do this, 
the equipment's going to get the oxygen that it needs. Now, as you look at this table, and I just made something up in Word, for indoors, you have to look at the conditioned space. You have to see what the amount of cubic feet or volume that you have per 1,000 BTUs of the equipment. Of course, you've got the corresponding code references up there. We've also got to con consider where are we taking the air from. If it's from indoors, how many openings typically for combustion air? One or two? Typically, it's two. You can get away with one. The Canadians like one for some reason. But we're going to find we're making some assumptions with that. But you can see we've got all kinds of different numbers up here. One square inch per 1,000 BTUs all the way up to one square inch per 4,000 BTUs, depending on the location. Now, how do we know this works? <laughs> Uh-oh. There's a hard question. How do we know that these actually work? A group of engineers got together and they asked that same question. They said, how do we know this works? Something smells fishy. We're calling bunk on this. So they started digging. They started doing some questions. They could find no technical basis for these recommendations according to code, and that's what we hang our hat on in our industry. We consider this as the gospel. However, measurements prove that sometimes they work, Sometimes they don't. Let's take a look at what the engineers found. They asked why. Now, if you guys want this, a quick Google search will pull it up. There's also a 200-page research paper on this. It's called ASHRAE Research Project 735, if you want to look it up. This is only eight pages. It's, it's a lot easier to read. I'm all about simple, guys. If you're really interested, you want to go nuts into it, you can go read the 200-page document. It's really cool. But if, you're, if you like that stuff. But here in a nutshell is what they found as they went through this. They tested code approved installations. They had dampers on them. Sometimes we've run into combustion air installations that are interlocked. The equipment comes on, dampers open up, right? They tested it both ways. Multiple configurations they tested this. They ran it from top to bottom. They heated the combustion air. They checked with different pressures. They checked at different outdoor conditions barometric pressures, wind conditions, and they documented everything. Here's what they found. All these configurations had different ventilation rates, and none of them were consistent. The installation that they put in, based off of what we just looked at, should have provided those guys 70 CFM under all conditions. Makes sense, right? Because if we install a combustion air duct, air is supposed to go through it, right? How does the air know that? How does the air know? As we get into air basics, we're going to look at, there's some principles that drive airflow that you guys know. We're just going to take it 90 degree shift. Check at that variation, guys. 15 to 1 was the variation on their air flows. And as the combustion air changed, your air flows changed. Now, we talk about a combustion triangle. What are the three things that we need on that combustion triangle? Fuel, oxygen, which is air, and a source of ignition. Those three provide heat. Do we do a good job of controlling the fuel source? We've got gas regulators, gas valves, adjustments, right? We, we regulate that. We control it. What about the ignition source? We control the ignition source, right? I mean, sometimes we've got it down to a 30 second of an inch in distance, timing down to a second for how long it should be on and then kick off. Now, here's a hard question. Do we control combustion air? <laughs> Uh, maybe. We're going, to take, we're going to see about that. We're going to see how much the flue design has an impact on that, because that's the other part of the equation. And the Germans call this the Gozenta Gozauta. The combustion air in the German, that's the, that's the Gozenta, and the flue's the Gozauta. So we've got to make sure that they, they do what they're supposed to. We're going to talk about that. Guys, that's unacceptable. A 15 to 1 variation. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it worked too much. Mother Nature controlled combustion air in these instances. 
I'm going to teach you guys how to control it. Now, what these engineers found was that mechanical systems, they proved reliable, consistent, and they could repeat the results every single time. So using a fan, we're all airheads, right? Airheads in this tent's a good thing. We're airheads. Guys, we can control air, so I'm going to walk you through how to do that. Now, when we look at some influencers on combustion air, we run ducts vertically or horizontally, and we assume the air direction, right? That pipe that's coming through the ceiling there and is wide open, what do we assume that that's going to do? We assume it's bringing in outside air, right? And guys, we're clever. Sometimes we will actually put labels on there or we'll write it in a Sharpie, combustion air, and then we'll put an arrow. Like the air goes, oh, I gotta go down that one. I can't go down the other one. Air can't read a code book, air can't read labels. We have to direct it, because there's some things that drive it. So we're gonna look at a function of draft, and this is where we're gonna start talking about flues a little bit. What drives flues and what causes them? I want you to look at things, we're gonna tie everything back to air. So I want you to look at them a little bit differently. What's crazy is you start to look at combustion air, it's the same physics that drive a duct system. There's nothing different. There's no difference in how we do this. So we're gonna talk about draft, what its function is, what it does, its role, and it's really important. And we're gonna talk about buildings. Buildings are actually part of a duct system. There's two sides we're gonna talk about. And we're going to look at the difference, and then we're going to see what we're assuming happens once we start punching holes in the walls or through the ceiling to see what happens. Then we're going to get into some very fundamental elements of pressure and airflow, and we're going to tie every single one of these into combustion air so you can see what's influencing these. And then I'll give you guys some visual clues to look for. You've probably been seeing this stuff all along and been going, oh, that's what's causing that. So I'm hoping that there's some big aha moments as we go through this section. So let's talk about flus. Everybody say this with me. A flu is a duct. A flu is a duct. It's an opening between the indoors and the outdoors. And just like a duct system, it's dependent on pressure difference. Now, there's two driving forces on a flu, temperature and pressure. Now, we assume that the flue is going to remove the flue gases. Notice I said assume. That's the intention. Draft, this was really important. If you guys are taking notes, I need you to write this one down. There's very few things I'm going to recommend you write down. This is one that you need to write down. Draft is the force that controls combustion air. It's that second bullet point up there. Draft is the force that controls combustion air. As we start to look at these influencers, we're going to see how they influence draft. Because as draft changes, so does combustion air. That's a relationship I want you guys to take out of this. As draft goes up, more combustion air. Draft goes down, less combustion air. So as draft is constantly moving up and down, our combustion air is changing. That's what the engineers in that ASHRAE study were measuring. As draft changed, they saw the combustion air rates that they were measuring through flow stations change, sometimes drastically. We want to start narrowing that down and fine tune that range to something that's going to be acceptable. Now, of the two that control draft, temperature difference and pressure difference, which do you think has more of an effect, temperature or pressure? Everybody says pressure. If pressure is what affected draft the most, we'd all be dead. If we ever stopped in a mechanical room, we would be dead. Temperature is the number one driver on draft. The heat of the flue gases is what creates that flow. Those that are familiar, we're going to talk about stack effect in a little bit. Stack effect is an old school term for flu. So you could also think of stack effect as flue effect, and this is where we start to tie the building as being part of a duct system in. Temperature is a big driver when it comes to flue draft. So this is why it's so important that the equipment that you guys install is fired correctly. If we underfire it, the flue gases are really cool, we don't get a lot of draft. Now, CAS is a term we see thrown around a lot. That's an abbreviation. 
What is a CAS? It's an it's area that our, it's basically a mechanical room. That is the combustion appliance zone that any vented equipment's located in. So anytime you see that little term CAS up there, we're talking about a combustion appliance zone, any area that has vented equipment in it. So that's what we're going to be referencing if you guys see that term floating around as we go through this. Now, flues are ducts that connect indoor to outdoor. Have you guys ever looked at them like that before? I'm ashamed to say I never did. I was like, oh, that's a flu. Flu gases are going out. We assume all this stuff. At least I did. Maybe you guys are more advanced than I am. And the combustion air duct, oh, air comes down that one. But there's some driving forces that affect that. Now, buildings are ducts. When you look at this, we've got just a nice standard building, furnace up in an attic. We're going to assume it's a perfect duct system. Everything's sealed, airflow's balanced. All the air that's going into the duct system is coming out. All the air that's being delivered into the building is coming out. We've got nice, solid flow moving through there. Now, how many of you guys have ever considered this before, that the building is actually a duct system? There's two different sides of the duct system that we have to deal with. Sometimes we deal with them unintentionally. And when we deal with combustion air, we have to understand that second side of that duct system. The first side of the duct system is the traditional side. The traditional side is what we deal with. That's the sheet metal. That's the ducts, flex, sealant, balancing dampers. Make sense so far? Registers, grills. Anything that affects air movement. That's the traditional side of the duct system. Now, the building side of the duct system is what makes the connection from the supply air coming out of the supply registers in that illustration back to the return grill. Now, for a duct system to work right, what are some of the aspects that it has to have? Ducts need to be leaky or tight? Got to be tight, right? You can't control air unless you can contain it. Well, what about balancing dampers? Is it a good idea to have dampers to control airflow? Yeah. What about insulation? Got to have insulation. Yes, please. Got to have insulation because we're trying to reduce what? Heat, heat loss or gain, heat flow. We're trying to reduce that through thermal resistance and insulation. So as we look at these, those are the principles that we need on a duct system, right? Those same principles apply to a building. It needs to be tight. A lot of times builders say, well, the house, the house needs to breathe. Great, where would you like me to knock the holes? You can't control air until you, can, until you contain it. You gotta seal it. It's the same thing with trying to balance a duct system that's leaking like crazy. You can't do it. You can't control ventilation. You can't control air changes in a building until you control the leakage rates. So those of you that are getting into building science, it ties in to combustion air as well. There is a direct correlation. As a matter of fact, some of the terms like stack effect come from that market. So notice that we've got a continuous flow here. The building is what provides the connection from the supply air to the return air. Now, one of the things that we do, if everything's perfect, great. No pressure difference. Now, what we do is we start sticking ducts inside this building part of the duct system. We stick fuel-fired equipment in it. We'll take another duct, and we'll stick it through the roof that's wide open, and we'll assume air is going to come down it. And because it's thought according to code, we go, everything's working great. Guys, we're the only industry that's crazy enough to start fires in somebody's house and not test them to prove them and make sure that they're safe. Is that a fair assessment, or is that a little brutal? I'm not saying you guys, but our industry in general. Now, as we test, we can make sure that both the building side and their traditional side work. So consider all the components. Buildings are really sandwiches of stuff. As you start to break it down, we looked at kind of that big picture before. When you look at the different mechanical systems, the different pieces and parts of that, you start to add in doors, a roof, the HVAC system, ventilation systems, all these different components. Notice, I can't go with the laser, so you guys will have to bear with me. I'll try to walk you through this. Notice the duct system as it goes through and penetrates the ceiling. It becomes a part of that building at that point. Any penetration through that drywall becomes part of the building. So we have to account for how that pressure difference is going to change. Because if it does, and it will, it's going to affect combustion air, how it's entering. Sometimes it'll work great. Other times, not so good. We take all these materials. 
we start to smash them together. We start to crunch them down, and we start to make them fit. So with that, is a building airtight? Are we building submarines and refrigerators yet? We're not there. We're getting there, but not yet. So with that, there's field installation variables that we have to account for. And you cannot account for them until you measure. So measurement is going to be key with this. There's one variable that we can't measure for and that we have to allow for, though, and that's the occupants. People start living inside the duct system. And when they do, they start changing damper positions. And I'm not talking about dampers in the ducts. I'm talking about conditioned space manual dampers. We call them doors. They start opening, closing doors. What happens to airflow and pressures inside the building as people start to open and close doors? It's a moving target, isn't it? It changes all over the place. People living inside the building can actually change combustion air just by changing door positions. So we're going to look at some solutions on how you guys can fix that. So buildings or ducts. Any questions or comments so far? I've kind of gone through this a little quick. Yes? You made a point earlier um, about the, when you're showing the slide about the 15 to 1 ratio. And I've got an issue that I've been dealing with where I believe the building is a negative pressure, <coughs> not allowing the furnace to light with the hand running. Excellent. So the question that was, the comment that was made was, uh, Luke's running into a situation where you've got a, you believe you're running into a negative pressure situation in a building, looking at the 15 to 1 ratio, and you're, it sounded like you had an aha moment when you encountered that. But he thinks that 15 to 1 may be what he's dealing with, is combustion air is changing. You're going to like the end of this, because we're going to talk about how to fix that, depending on your installation. And all these people that's putting uh, these big kitchen in anymore. And oh. Kitchen, you know, they went from a standard fan and they put it in, this thing's taking six or 700 CFMs out. Well, then it's got to get that air from somewhere. That's right. And then you will start pulling down the combustion. Excellent. So the comment was made on combustion air. We're putting six, 700, sometimes up to 1,600 CFM exhaust hoods in residential appliances. That air has to come back in from somewhere. That's an excellent point. For those of you who do kitchens, restaurants, and stuff, that make up air is coming right down on the kitchen. And then I'm sorry, I'm from Arizona, so in the winter time, uh, it gets cold, you know, 60 degrees, and they'll turn off the makeup air. It starts pulling makeup air from bathroom vents. So the question was made in Arizona when it's in their winter, which all of us just, we, it's hard for us to sympathize with you, Jake. Their winter that they have in Arizona, <laughs> that, you know, when it gets warmer, they start to shut off the makeup air. And that makeup air is coming in from somewhere. You guys make it some excellent points because that's air, air doing what it does. So fantastic points. Thank you for that. Your winter's awesome, man. I love your winter in Phoenix. Yeah, so it's awesome. I told you guys, to, you know, take some notes. Here's why I'd recommend you take some more. I encourage you, the next couple of slides, take some notes on these. Here's my promise to you. The most complicated combustion air issues that you run into will boil down to one of five topics I'm getting ready to talk about. It will typically fall into one of those five buckets. Sometimes it's multiple buckets. But if you understand what I'm going to talk about on the next two slides, I can pretty much sit down and we can end this presentation. I won't, but you'll have it in a nutshell, what's going on. Now, the first, because you're going to go, Dave, this is too simple. We know this stuff. And that's right, you do know this stuff. But once again, it's that 90 degree shift to look at things a little bit differently through a different set of lenses from a different angle and apply what we know to combustion air. So, how many of you guys know this? If you have an opening, it takes a pressure difference for flow to move through that. That's one of the most basic principles of airflow. Everybody in this room knows that, right? So whichever side has the higher pressure difference, it will drive air to the other. Mother Nature loves balance. She will rot a building, and she will kill a family to get it. Pressures like to be neutral, balance. It's one of those universal things. The higher the pressure difference, the higher the 
flow. The higher the pressure difference, the higher the flow. So as you look at this, we've got an opening. If there's no pressure difference across that opening, there's no flow. If you've got a little pressure difference across that opening, I'm looking at the bottom middle, a little pressure difference, you get a little flow. If there's a big pressure difference, you get a big flow across it. All right? We like big flows, not, all, not for combustion air. Too much flow is not good. So we get this, right? There has to be something that creates flow across an opening. Now, here's something I would encourage you to do. We, it got a little breezy yesterday. felt awesome. I want you to watch this side of the tent this afternoon if the breeze kicks back up and see if it's always blowing out. You're going to see something. You're going to watch it go out, and you're going to watch it come in. And you're going to watch it go out, and you're going to watch it come in. And I want you to think about this. What if there was a combustion air grill in that wall, even though it's fabric, it would do the same thing. You guys having any aha moments yet? As the wind changes, that's actually one of the drivers that affects pressure difference, and you can't account for it. I'd, I'd recommend you either take a photo of these, write them down. This is your super complicated diagnostics rules to follow. These four rules, guys, most complicated things you run into on combustion air are going to boil back down to these typically. And that first rule, and some, you know, some guys may switch these up. That's cool. Just, I just want you to remember them and know how they apply to what we're getting ready to talk about. First rule, air takes the path of, everybody can say it at once, path of least resistance. We know this stuff. The path of least resistance. Always. Air's lazy. We have to direct it. Rule number two, any air that's leaving a building, it's trying to come back in from someplace else. One CFM out. One CFM in, that's the exhaust fans that you guys were talking about, kitchen exhaust hoods. That's the principle that they operate off of. The third rule, higher pressure, lower pressure. You guys see, these are things that we know, but we're going to take them, we're going to plug them into combustion air. And then rule number four, although it's super simplified, hot air rises, cooler air falls and displaces it. And we're going to look at how this ties in to combustion air ducts, because as those principles are happening, those rules are going on, they create both infiltration and exfiltration. Now, we understand how these apply to comfort issues. John explained to us yesterday how they apply to IEQ issues. Now, let's talk about how they apply to combustion air. If you have infiltration, what's combustion air doing? Think of the first two letters. In. Combustion air is going in through infiltration. If you have exfiltration, what's combustion air doing? Think of the first two letters and then add IT to it. Exit. It's leaving the building. So we either have air coming in or going out. This is always happening. Remember rule number two, if you've got one CFM in going, going out, you've got one CFM coming in from someplace else to replace it. And sometimes it's coming from places that we don't want it to. So as we look at this, there has to be a driving force. As we said earlier, buildings are sandwiches of material. There has to be a driving force. So as we look at these, there's some things to consider. Wind is the first. It's the unknown variable that you can't account for. As we talked yesterday, you're going to see air moving in and out of this building and you can liken that to combustion air. It's changing drastically. Now, if we have fuel-fired equipment in this building, we're wide open to the outdoors. You're not going to run out of combustion air, right? You would think so. You shouldn't. I was teaching in a class in Dallas a few years ago, and we did our hands-on training at a vocational school out there. There were two doors approximately this size, probably 20 by 20, wide open for carpentry students. The HVAC equipment was on the opposite end of the building. As we walk up to it, the doors were off the two 80% furnaces. There was also a natural draft boiler that was there. Guess which way the inducers were spinning? They were going backwards. Every heat exchanger has a pressure drop to it. So for air to come down the flue, overcome the pressure drop of the heat exchanger, and then go out the burner openings, that's a lot of depressurization, and it can happen. Now, with two 20 by 20 openings, Shouldn't that have been enough combustion air? 
You would think so. But for whatever reason, wind, the air wanted to come down. What do you think happened when I went down and talked to the carpentry guys? And I said, you care if we close those doors for a couple of seconds? What do you think happened to the inducers going backwards? You think they kept on going? They stopped. We stopped the path because air takes the path of least resistance. Those 20 by 20 doors were the path of least resistance. So here's what was happening. On that illustration that you guys can see, those arrows, and this is a very, very simplified illustration of what happens with wind. Wind does all kinds of funky stuff on a building. As you're seeing the air, arrows moving from left to right, what you're seeing is the windward side of the building. If you have combustion air ducts on that side, air will push into those grills, and that will cause infiltration when the wind's blowing. Now, you guys tell me what's going to happen on the opposite side. If that wind's still blowing that same direction, and it's coming out the right-hand side, it'll be exiting. Those combustion air grills will actually act as exhaust grills because of pressure difference. Anybody having any oh crap moments yet? Because the air is doing what it naturally does. We can't assume it. You can have properly sized openings in a wall and this will still happen. Isn't that interesting? Wind can cause this. It can also cause some goofy stuff that happens if you take the ducts vertical. If the wind is the only driving force that we have, if there's no wind, what happens to combustion air? No combustion air. You have to have an opening. You have to have a pressure difference across it. Now, the second way that we talked about combustion air, we talked about the stack or the building being a duct. When we talk about stack effect, what we're talking about is the building acting as the flue. Hot air rises and it goes out any openings in the upper part of that building. It enters in the lower part. So what you're seeing with those blue arrows in that illustration is infiltration, air coming in at the lower parts. And you're seeing exfiltration at the upper parts. Now in between that, you've got a center spot and it, it constantly moves. It's what's called a neutral pressure plane and it constantly changes depending on out, outsoar, outside and indoor temperature differences. So as you see that change, these exfiltration and infiltration points stop. Have you guys ever wondered why CO poisonings go up so drastically in the wintertime? What typically gets the blame? Furnace, right? Cracked heat exchangers. It's causing all those CO poisonings. Cracked heat exchangers are a defect, absolutely. But here's what I would submit to you. We're fighting a building problem more than we're fighting a cracked heat exchanger problem. The building is becoming the chimney. And guys, we're trying to fight it with equipment. You ever think about that? Air changes directions in the summertime. This is why we don't see it, why it's more prevalent. Those arrows, they flip in the summer. You have hot, warm air coming in through the upper spots. Cool air leaves down low. Those of you that are in cooling dominated climates that have multi-story homes, if you can hang meat on the first floor, but it feels and smells like the attic on the second floor, you're fighting a leaking building. It's bringing probably 10 tons of load in through the attic to a system that may only be designed to handle three or four tons. You can't counteract that with HVAC. This type of an effect affects combustion air. Now, what causes stack effect? What's the driving force that creates stack effect? Temperature. Now, let me ask you guys a question, because this is a common misconception in our industry. Do you have to heat up the walls of a house to create stack effect? What are you heating? The air. You're heating the air. That's what creates the stack. That's what creates the draft in the building. Common misconception in our industry is we have to heat the flu to create the flow. We don't have to heat the flu. We have to heat the temperature of the air inside of it. A lot of guys say, well, I got a cold flu. If you have a cold flu, you're fighting a building problem. Air comes down through depressurization. 
This is where we start to talk about some of these influences. These are just natural influences. You can't control air in a leaky building. What about mechanical influences? You start to put a fan behind these things. That's just Mother Nature controlling it in the previous slides. Now we're actually putting fans behind this. Up to four times more of an influence than Mother Nature. And they're consistent. Supply duct leakage. And you start to look at this. If you've got combustion equipment located inside the conditioned space and you have supply duct leakage to the unconditioned space, you're pulling that space into a vacuum. And it's trying to get air from wherever it can get it. Now, time back to those four rules that we talked about. Air takes the path of least resistance. And for every one CFM that is being lost, one CFM is coming back in to replace it. If you're losing supply air into a crawl space or an attic, where, where's the rest of the air coming from? It's coming from the conditioned space, right? So anytime that blower runs, if you've got this situation, you can depressurize that space. It essentially starts to suck those walls in. And you're trying to get air from wherever you can get it. Kitchen exhaust hoods, same thing we just talked about. Ah. Right. Gotcha. So, excellent point, Mark. So the comment that was made was crawl space encapsulation. You've got equipment that's one pipe in a crawl space. It's dependent on air coming from the outdoors. And if you seal off those openings, you can't get the air to it. So how do you handle that? Well, this is where we're going to talk about using a fan to bring in air that's repeatable and it's consistent as you start to bring this back. Now, on the flip side of duct leakage, we've got supply side leakage without return side leakage. With return side leakage, it's exact opposite. Now you're blowing air into the space, but you may be pulling it from someplace else. So as we control, we look at air, we have to consider how it influences the system, how it influences any combustion piece of equipment that's located inside that space. Any questions or comments so far? Appreciate your comments. Now, duct leakage is pretty simple. Now, anybody in here doing duct sealing? No? I would hope every hand would go up. So... Here's something to keep in mind with duct sealing. Do you just randomly start grabbing pookie and slapping it on the ducts? You need to do one thing. If you, don't, if you do nothing else, one thing before you start sealing ducts. Just measure total external static pressure and compare it to the rated nameplate. See where it's at. If total external static pressure is high, those ducts may not need to be sealed. You need to dig a little bit deeper, find out why the static pressure is high. Because if you seal an undersized leaky duct system, what's going to happen to the total external static? It's going to go up, you're going to sign the death sentence on the equipment. Then the heat exchanger will crack, for sure. You may have signed the death sentence on it trying to do something good. So that's a pre-qualifier for any duct sealing. Sometimes it's something simple. Other times you've got to dig a little bit deeper. Now, sometimes it gets into some issues that you've got to take some additional measurements that we may not have on a service truck when we get into air balancing issues. And this is where we have either too much or not enough air being delivered into a space. So as we start to deal with air balancing issues, you have to measure at the registers and at the grills to be able to define if these situations are going on. And once again, these tie back down to some of the most basic airflow issues that we've talked about. Because they're taking the path of least resistance and also us being able to control it. You shut the damper off, you start to shut those, those conditions that down. Now, what about duct design? This looks like a standard house that some of you guys have to deal with. Let's say that you've got just a standard, this is just a ranch, it could be on a slab, central return, water heater is located in a closet there on the left hand side with a louvered door. Pretty standard install, right? So with all the doors open, and guys this could be a perfectly 
tight duct system. Everything's great on this thing. It's, it's balanced. The system is running pretty close to its laboratory rated capacity. You've done a rocking job. But something's, something's variable here. Something can change. What is it? Uh, we've got doors or <coughs> condition space manual dampers. Customers come home. They start living in the duct system. They start to change these damper positions, and things happen. When you close a door to a room that has a supply register only to it, or that has air balancing issues, you're going to change the pressure. Because now you have cut off any communication with the rest of the building. And air always takes the path of least resistance. So if you're pressurizing those bedrooms that only have supply registers only in them, what's it doing to the main body of that house? Where there's a fireplace and a water heater. It's depressurizing it, right? pulling it into a vacuum. And air takes the path of least resistance. So it's going to pull air from wherever it can get it. What are the two paths of least resistance in the house that we're looking at here? I'll give you a hint. We got a fireplace and we got a water heater. They will pull the air right out of the flue. Now you may say, well, what's to keep it from coming out of the combustion air duct? It may pull out of the combustion air duct too. We don't know. Because what's on top of that water heater that allows it to communicate with the house and any pressure changes that it has? A draft hood. If that water heater's got a draft hood on it. It is not a sealed system. It communicates with any pressure change inside that house. Now what's interesting, I mentioned the 2015 fuel gas code earlier. If you look at the definition of a draft hood and the definition of a relief opening, they're the exact same. Mm. Try looking it up, see what the definition is. You'll go, oh, I didn't know that's what it was. So as we look at this, as pressure changes, air starts to flow one direction or the other. And it can either go up a flue or it can go down a flue. Now, I mentioned the fireplace. Have you guys ever had issues with fireplaces, getting them to start? They smoke up the house. Sometimes your customers call and say, my house smells like my fireplace. That's what you're seeing. That's what you're running into. Now, guys, I'm from Kentucky, if you didn't pick up on the twang. So we do some really stupid stuff in it with HVAC in Kentucky. I mean, not only do we marry our cousins and flush our toilets over the hill, guys, we mess up HVAC royally. Here's one of the genius things that we used to do. We would have freestanding wood burners. And because we were redneck ingenuity, we would put sheet metal hoods over them. We would tie a duct off of that sheet metal hood into the return, and then we would start a fire in the wood burner. Kick the blower in the on position. What were we trying to do? Pull all that heat and circulate it through the house so everybody was nice and warm. What else were we doing? We were making sure that nobody was going to wake up when they went to bed. This was in our house. So if you guys wonder what's wrong with me, now you know. So there's things that we do. We're trying to have good intentions, and sometimes they don't work out so well because we ignored some of those four basic rules. So if you run into a house that's having a situation with a fireplace that's either smoking up the house or it smells like the fireplace, you may be chasing a building pressure problem. Any aha moments so far as I'm, if I've been going through this? Clothes dryers. Did you know that there have been situations where CO poisonings have occurred because somebody replaced the old clothes dryer with a new one because the newer ones are moving more air? It depressurized the space more. We're getting ready to talk about fans. I appreciate you bringing that up. So, and we mentioned HVAC first because it's one of the biggest air movers. There's other exhaust fans that can create a ton of interference with this. If you put a clothes dryer in here, kitchen exhaust hood. What are you doing to that effect? You're multiplying it. So we're going to walk through the steps on how to find that. This is where we get into exhaust fan interference. If you kick on a clothes dryer, the old clothes dryers exhaust around 70 CFM. Some newer clothes dryers are double to triple that. So they say that they're more efficient. No, they're just moving more air. Look at the specs on them. What about a whole house fan? You guys live in areas that a whole house fan will fail combustion air every single time. 
So be aware that if you have a whole house fan and you're not opening every single window up, you're in trouble. Now, let me go back. I'm not going to back up, but go back to, that, to what we talked about on stack effect, exfiltration and infiltration. With whole house fans, they tell you to raise all the windows. John, you're on the fire department. Have you ever heard that they'll say, you know, open a window if your CO alarm goes off? Okay, has anybody else heard that? Seal alarm goes off, open the windows. What if the windows that you open are on the top part, the upper part of that neutral pressure plane where exfiltration's happening? And it's a combustion air issue related to the building that's causing it. Does it get better or does it get worse? It gets worse, you just ramped up how fast that family's gonna get poisoned. But you guys understand then how air works now, we can look and tie some of these principles in. So fans typically can have up to 400% increase in how they change pressures. You're taking a mechanical device and you're moving large amounts of air. Now, they can create combustion air issues. They can also solve them. That's one of the big things I'm going to focus on, you guys solving these. So be aware of fan influences. How many of you in here are salespeople? Good. So everything I've said probably so far has been, has it been understandable and relatable? Great, I got double thumbs up. I know I'm doing good. So if you go out on a sales call, you may not do, some, do much testing, but there's some visual clues that you can look for. How many times have you guys ever seen the rust donut around a water heater draft hood? All the time. That's, that's, that's not a good thing, Mark. It's normal, but it's not a good thing. What's causing that? Ooh. Intense heat? Huh. It's not drafting properly. It's flue gas condensing. John Ellis said flue gas condensing. Flue gas has a pH of about 3.8. When you look at the combustion process, if everything works perfect, we get carbon dioxide and water vapor, right? It looks so innocent. But what happens when that full conversion doesn't take place? We get nasty stuff like carbon monoxide. And we also get carbonic acid. So when you see flue gas condensing on a metal surface, it will eat it up. It's not just a delta T. There should be no acidic properties in that water, unless you're from California. But as you start to get into the opening around that, that is flue gas condensing on that hood. Now, there's a couple of things it could be. It could be a combustion air problem. It could be a blocked flue. What's one of the number one restrictions in a blocked flue. Bird's nest, right? You guys see a lot of that? You guys have seen a house that's chimney, it isn't working. The only type of a bird that should be in a chimney is a dead one laying in the bottom of it with a piece of straw in its mouth. That chimney's working. If you have a bird's nest in a chimney, chimney doesn't work. The house is the chimney. You're seeing stack effect firsthand. The building is the flue. Now, why would I say that about bird's nest? What did the coal miners use for low-level CO alarms? Canaries, birds. There's no animal more susceptible to low-level CO poisoning than a bird. They'll drop dead if they get close to it. So you guys don't need to start packing birds or low-level CO monitors. So, guys, these are visual clues. If you see a bird's nest, a squirrel's nest, anything like that in a flu, that flu's not working. There is a visual clue for you. Check the draft hoods. Rust is one of those things that we see a lot and we think it's normal. Have you guys ever wondered why some equipment is perfectly clean? Other equipment, you'll go in and it's got an inch of rust sitting in the bottom of it. Why? Because the one that's clean, the flue gases are probably leaving the equipment. The one that's rusting, the flue gases are spilling and that's condensing inside that furnace. You guys see furnaces like that a lot? Tops of the burners all rusted up, all kinds of crap laying in the bottom, pilots all rusted up. You could probably see some signs of rollout around the top of that burner compartment. Looks pretty common, right? That's where Mother Nature's controlling combustion air. Sometimes it may work, sometimes it doesn't. So those are some common signs. Look for soot. Soot comes in different colors. I've got black and white up there. Another one to look for is gray. If you see gray soot in a piece of equipment, it looks like cellulose insulation. I thought one time, I was like, man, that furnace is just kind of burning dirty. 
It was burning dirty, but it was full of soot. It pegged my analyzer within 10 seconds, and I almost fell through the attic trying to shut the equipment off. So not a good thing. So any type of soot that is carbon in its unburned form, it takes thousands of parts per million of CO to produce that much soot. Another one, what about signs of rollout or spillage? If you see discoloration around the burner compartment, we assume that flue gases always leave the heat exchanger, right? There are situations where they don't. And instead of leaving the exhaust, they spill out the burner compartment and they will discolor and they'll rust anything that they come across. You guys ever seen water heater bases like that? They're kind of discolored. And you think, why is it dirty and brown like that? That's flue gas spillage. And it's discoloring the paint on that water heater. You'll also see melted grommets. No cold water, not even in Phoenix, Jake, is going to melt that cold, cold water grommet. All right, maybe, maybe. So if you see that, that's flue gas spillage. It won't always cause the rust. So these are just some quick visual clues that you guys can look for. There's one more. You don't need an engineering degree to figure out what's wrong with this. That's a Western Kentucky install, OK? We're from Central Kentucky. That's a Western Kentucky install. So yeah, it's not a Kentucky as Kentucky. It's a division of Kentucky. So and they do this in Louisville, too. So what's wrong here? <laughs> Somebody said a lot. The return air is all being pulled out of a plenum underneath the furnace. And we've got a solid condition space manual damper on there. We shut the damper, what happens? Oh, air takes the path of least resistance. One CFM in, one CFM out. We just created a chain reaction there. Oops. So these are the things that we can find as we start to just look at things. Then we start to measure them. Then we start to measure them. There's also building clues. You guys ever seen carpet discoloration around doors? Spider webs? It's a wall-to-wall -wall filter. That's a sign that air is moving underneath that door. And you're seeing the carpet filter that air as it's moving. So you can actually do a pressure test. Where's Steve Rogers at? I know they sell some instruments that do that. So you guys can actually measure that. Now, these telltale signs are telling you that air is moving. You won't know how much or which direction until you start to measure. So we've got to do that through our measurements. So let's look at some common installations that you guys have got. We've got high to low, vertical going outdoors, vertical to the attic, and also louvered door. All right, so based off what you know now, we've talked about some of these common influencers. How often do you think this works? <laughs> what depends on this working? Pressure, because that's the opening. It depends on pressure. Pressure and temperature are what drives flow through those. Depending on which is greater is going to depend on which way the air goes. Typically, you'll see these work about half the time. The other half the time, they're exhausting air. Now, have you ever wondered why there's two openings? Why two openings? The engineers in that ASHRAE study, they asked the same question. Why? So you can cover one of them? This ought to scare you guys to death. The second opening was supposed to act as a secondary flue in case the main flue became restricted or blocked. Really? That's how we're protecting our customers? Oh, no problem. There's a secondary flue. But it's like any flue gas spillage. It knows to go out there, right? Oh, crap, I'm spilling. I better go out that top opening this time. Right? Pressure opening. Now, there are solutions for this. There are solutions for this, so don't. How many guys are going, oh man, you're just dumping all this bad news on us? Is this changing how you look at things? If I'm causing you to think and how you look at your combustion air installations, I've succeeded in what I wanted to do. Now let's talk about vertical ducts. Knowing what you know now about stack effect, what is probably gonna happen on that duct that's going through the roof? 
Because, but wait a minute, it's got a down arrow. It's supposed to be a combustion air duct. But hot air does what? Stack effect. And air takes the path of least resistance. I'm going to walk down the screen for a second. I got to show you guys something. So let's talk about this. There is a ceiling plane up here. If you have more opening in that ceiling plane, that above that neutral pressure point, if you have more opening above that than free area of the combustion air duct, the building becomes the chimney. Make sense? Let's say that we've got a 12 by 12 duct coming down, 144 square inches. Let's say that we've got 200 can lights in the attic, those little wonderful electric chimneys. Let's say that we've got ducts in the attic and they all leak. Let's say that we've got an attic access, it leaks. And we've got 300 square inches of equivalent leakage in the ceiling plane. Now what's the flue and what's the combustion air duct? Because air takes the path of least resistance. We can fix that. Here's a common one. This is probably the most common. Two pipes. One should be within how far from the floor? 12 inches. How far should one be from the ceiling? 12 inches. Why? No one knows. <laughs> so, as we start to measure these, remember the top one is secondary flu, the bottom one is supposed to be the inlet. Hmm. Now, most attics are ventilated, correctly? Is that right? Okay, now, for an attic to be ventilated, unless it's foamed, if it's foamed, it gets really interesting. But let's say that that attic is a standard attic. It should be ventilated. What pressure would that attic be under for air to ventilate? It'd have to be at atmospheric, probably a little negative, won't it? Because hot air rises and goes out the eaves, which means what is probably going to happen to that duct? You think air is going to go out or come in? It's going to go out. Don't take my word for this. I'm going to talk about some test instruments here in a couple seconds you can use to test this. You guys can get toilet paper. Just you got to use single ply though. It's got to be John Wayne type. <laughs> use single wall, hold it at the bottom of that duct, and watch which way it goes. I promise you, if you hold it at the bottom of that duct, it's going to go and suck right up in it. Just watch what it does. Just test it and see. It's really cool. You lose a lot of toilet paper up into an attic. Now, there's a situation, though, in some parts of the country, like uh, Arizona, that we get into, we stick things on top of the roof that are temperature controlled. What are they? Oh, powered attic ventilators. Gets hot in the attic. Kicks the fan on. I could never convince my dad that these were bad things. Some guys are setting their ways. What does that do to the attic? You just put the depressurization on steroids. Now, it's, now the assumption is, oh, it's going to pull all the air through the eave. The air doesn't know that, just like with combustion air. It has no clue which way it's supposed to go. We have to direct it. It's going to pull right to those combustion air ducts, and it can depressurize that main space. So are you guys seeing where we're, we're missing the mark on this? But then we go, hey, it's code approved, right? When you boil it down to its most basic terms, what is a code approved system? It's the minimum. It's the worst job that you can do by law and get away with it. That's not something you strive for. You guys encourage your kids to get D minuses? Great job, pal, way to go. No, we encourage you to go better. And that's what we're getting ready to talk about, our A plus installations, how you make this work, and how you guys serve your customers better, profit from it. Now, what about louvered doors? I hope you guys are looking at this differently. This is the last one we're going to look at. Let's boil it down to air again. You notice this reoccurring theme. We keep breaking it back down to the principles. It's air. It's what air does. If the blower's off, you've got temperature creating that draft. Now, when we switched from natural draft equipment to 80% induced draft equipment, chimneys started rotting out left and right. We blame the equipment. We said it's the equipment, colder flu temperatures. Flu temperatures aren't colder on 80% equipment. They're actually warmer 
when you account for the mixing that takes place with a draft hood. What we did was we took the opening out. And when you remove the opening, you remove the drying effect. Think about this back to buildings. In the wintertime, if you've got a dry house, it's a drafty house. It's leaking a lot. If you can't control the humidity in that building, it's leaking a lot. So we've got natural air movement. Once the blower kicks on, though, what happens? What do you think is going to happen here, guys? It's a louver door. Yeah. Path of least resistance. That blower kicks on. We've got a central return. Air will pull backwards through those louvered doors to get to the return out through the draft hood. What's going to happen once we start closing bedroom doors? Oh, oh, oh. Now I'm starting to hurt. Because it gets even worse. Because now we're blocking off the air pathway back to that return. We're creating more negative pressure, if that's even a word or a term. We're depressurizing that space even worse. And we're increasing how that's spilling. Any other piece of equipment that's in there will also spill. Now, let's talk about test instruments. You're, you'll notice in this list, I don't have a tape measure and I don't have a calculator. Your number one test instrument for troubleshooting combustion air issues is going to be a combustion analyzer. If you don't have one, you need one, like yesterday. You also need two more instruments. You need a draft gauge, and you also need a micromanometer. So thank God the prices of those are coming down, because now they're, they're affordable, fantastic testing that you can do with them. So why do we start with combustion testing? Because number one, you have to start with the combustion readings, multiple combustion readings. The code tells us that we need to take one single air-free CO reading after five minutes of operation. It's insufficient. It doesn't tell you what the action of the flue gases are. You have to know if the CO's rising and if the oxygen's falling. That's unstable combustion. If you see that, guys, you got a problem. You got a time bomb, and it's just waiting for the right time to go off. We're getting ready to look at those readings and what they look like. Now, is it a good idea to use your analyzer for your personal protection device? Everybody do this. Because once you take the analyzer probe and you insert it into the flu, which is the proper place to test, now you have no way of monitoring the ambient space. You need two separate devices, one for personal protection, which has a both audible visual alarm on it, and then you need something to actually measure the flue gases with. I don't care what test instruments you use for combustion analyzers. I really don't. We've got multiple brands up there. It needs to do three things. If it does these three things, it's all I care about. I don't care what the name is, what color it is. It needs to do carbon monoxide, oxygen, and flue temperature. If it does those three things, it's great. If it only does oxygen, and temperature, it's useless. Don't waste your money on it. A fourth requirement, it's not a measurement, but it's just to make your life easier, is it has to have a pump on it. If it has an aspirator bulb and you gotta sit here and do this, it's not worth your investment. So whatever color, whatever flavor you wanna use, I don't care. Just make sure that it does these things. Now, do you charge for a combustion test? You better include it in your pricing somehow. So we tried to charge for this when we first started doing this. I'm going to share a, a failure story with you guys. It's, almost, it's always so much better to learn from someone else's failures than doing it yourself. So here's where I failed on this. We started trying to sell this as an add-on when we first start, started doing it. We were like, oh, yeah, we're going we're to make all kinds of money doing this. So we tried to sell combustion testing as an add-on. Some customers were like, oh, yeah, that's great. Others were like, eh, we don't care. We're safe so far. Our CO alarm's not going off. But everybody been beat, anybody here ever been beat up by an old woman? It sucks. I had an old lady kick my rear end. We went in, and I told her, never forget her name, it was Miss Saylor. Miss Saylor, you know, we're offering this service, told her about all the benefits. She said, sweetie, that's great. Shouldn't you guys be doing that anyway? Dude, that old lady laid me out. And I kind of bowed my head down. Sorry for the audio blast. Bowed my head down. I said, yes, ma'am, we should. Changed how we did everything from that point forward. Everything got tested. 
Why? Because it was the right thing to do. But let me believe, believe you me, though, we charged for it. We had to. Because there are maintenance fees that go along with this. Every two years, you can bank on it, you're going to replace an oxygen sensor. They just, they go bad. Carbon monoxide sensors are a little bit more durable. But there will be maintenance issues. If you want to self-destruct the oxygen sensor, leave the hoses attached. They'll go bad in a year, sometimes six months. So take care of the test instruments, they'll take care of you. They do need to be calibrated, so be sure that you send them back in. Uh, printers are great if you want printed results. I mean, that, that's fantastic. You only need three, CO, oxygen, and temperature. The rest is a bunch of calculations, a bunch of useless stuff that'll do nothing but confuse you and your customers. CO, oxygen, temperature. You also need draft, not from the combustion analyzer. Because if you're measuring it on a natural draft piece of equipment, draft is taken in a different location than your test, lo your test measurements for combustion. So you've got to make sure you're testing in the right spot. You also need a draft gauge. Oddly enough, this thing's called a Dwyer 460 air meter. It's like 40 bucks. You can probably get one from Bill. It really sucks at measuring air, but it's awesome at measuring draft. And here's the reason. It's visual. There is a small white ball that moves up and down in that gauge, and it visually represents the building breathing. It represents draft. And typically with draft, we're looking for a negative 0.01 to 0.02 inches of water column draft. That's based on the pressure drop needs of the heat exchanger in most instances. Now, there's other formulas that'll teach you how to do it based off of outdoor temperature and pascals and all that. And if you want to do all that, knock yourselves out. I'm just going to tell you based off the pressure drop of the heat exchanger. So as we look at this, we're not necessarily looking so much for a hard number. We're looking for a range of motion. We're looking to see what that ball does as different appliances kick on. As we start to change door positions, we want to see what happens to that ball. Does it go up or does it go down? What do you guys think happens if the ball goes up? What's that telling us about draft? Draft's going up. As draft goes up, combustion air does what? It increases. Because draft is the force that controls combustion air. So as draft goes up, combustion air increases. As draft goes down, what happens to combustion air? It decreases. It goes down. Uh-oh. Any movement down on that ball is a bad thing. Really bad. And you need to figure out why. This is why when we start to turn on fans, we start to change door positions. We're going to see what causes that ball to drop. Because that's the line in the sand that we got to figure out that we need to fix. That's, that's what we can't cross. You're also going to need a micromanometer, high precision manometer, to measure building pressures, to see what's going on in the equipment and also in the building side of the duct system. Now, when you test, we're going to start with the equipment. Actually, we're going to start someplace else. Where's the first place that you start before you walk in on any job? We talked about it up front. Ambient. Your personal safety is number one. Then we go to the equipment. Then we measure draft. Then we move to building pressures. And guys, this is, just, this is a process that you can follow. It works. Try it. See how it works. It works for you. Where should you test the equipment? It depends. If it has a draft hood, you need to test before that draft hood. And what we're looking for here are those three readings, CO, oxygen, and temperature. When we're dealing with combustion air issues, we are looking more at CO and oxygen. I want to know what the pattern of the CO reading and the oxygen is. If it's stable, I'm feeling pretty good. If, it's, if CO's rising and oxygen's falling, completely different story. So we want to test before any dilution air has mixed outside the combustion process. So anything after that draft hood is a diluted reading. And you're going to get really screwy numbers. At a minimum, there's typically a 100 to 1 dilution rate there. So stay away from measuring above the draft hood for your combustion readings. Measure at the outlet of each heat exchanger opening. Well, when we get into 80% furnace, there's no draft hood. Now, you do want to be a minimum of 12 inches away from the inducer outlet. So you're going to need to install a test port in the flue. Now, why would I say that we're going to install a test port and not drill a hole? 
Do, cust do your customers want you drilling holes in their stuff? No. Don't tell your customer that they're, you're going to drill a hole in their flue. <laughs> You'll get kicked out of the house faster than anything. They don't want you drilling holes in their flue. Even if it's on a water heater. You think customers will freak out? A lot of technicians will freak about this because you can't get the analyzer probe down in to the outlet of that heat exchanger on a water heater. They'll freak out because you have to drill a small hole in the hood. It's got a great big freaking hole already in it. What's a little one going to matter, right? But don't, you don't drill holes. We install test ports. And we're doing that to make sure combustion air is accurate. So there's a water heater. Now, you'll notice that there's no illustrations up here of condensing equipment. And that's because by definition, when you've looked at all the causes that we're talking about, you can't have a combustion air problem on condensing equipment. Those of you that work on equipment a lot for 90 percenters, what's the typical pressure switch rated at? Like an inch, isn't it? Over an inch? Those little inducers are strong. They're very strong. As we talk about combustion air, it takes natural pre building pressures or a fan to interfere with them. Very rarely will you ever encounter that on 90% equipment. It'll always be natural drafts or more commonly category one equipment, if you're looking at it by code definition. So if it's a boiler, regardless of where the draft hood is, you're going to measure your combustion readings before the draft hood. If you can gain access to each individual heat exchanger outlet, measure it. If you can only get underneath the hood, you need one reading. And what you're looking for is the area of the highest CO number. Now, as you take your readings, it's important to keep in mind that just because you got a code approved installation, that doesn't mean it's safe. Code says something has to be there. It doesn't say it has to work. What makes this installation dangerous? What happens if somebody blocks the top of that flue off and the furnace runs? Uh-oh. Remember that a draft hood's definition is also a relief opening. That draft hood will act as a relief opening for that furnace. The furnace will run nonstop and spill 100% of its gases out the top of the water heater. It'll run all day long. But you may say, wait a minute, doesn't that furnace have a pressure switch in it? What happens to the pressure switch if there's a relief opening? It thinks everything's great. It has no way of knowing that the flu is restricted. This is what we call the most dangerous installation allowed by code. You guys run into this installation a lot? All the time. You run into occasional pilot outages on them. You ever see that? Let's talk about what's going on. If you have an occasional pilot outage, the water heater's running. Everything's great. Typically, this will happen early morning. Homeowner gets out of the shower. Like, oh, man, it's cold. Turn the furnace on. Furnace kicks on. What does that inducer do for about 35 to 45 seconds? It purges. Why the pre-purge? Because all gas valves leak. 10% of the lower explosive limits. What happens if the ignition source comes on at the same time the gas valve energizes? Hopefully it'll light. <laughs> You're warmer quicker. What happens if the gas valve comes on before the ignition source? Things go boom. It's bad when things go boom. So just in case there's any residual fuel in here, the inducer is going to pre-purge, clear all that out, verify that the flue is opening or open unless it's on this installation, and then it will allow the sequence of heating operation to continue. While that's happening, that water heater is filling flue gases. Now, we talked earlier about the combustion byproducts. Carbon dioxide is one of those combustion byproducts. Carbon dioxide is heavier than air. If it doesn't leave the equipment, it backs up inside the heat exchanger. That's where you start to see the CO starting to rise. Because if the flue gases can't get out, guess what can't get in? Combustion air. So the whole time you're seeing combustion air being displaced because of the impact of that inducer. And you'll see that through your combustion readings, which we're getting ready to show you. You guys can see this with the draft gauge also, if you're measuring in the flue of that water heater. 
It will let you know what's going on. Here's the readings. You guys might want to write these down. These readings are indicative of a combustion air problem. And you'll notice we haven't pulled out a tape measure. We haven't looked at anything. All we're looking at are combustion numbers. CO's going up. Oxygen is going down. Temperature's really a non-factor. I'm not too worried about temperature. CO, oxygen, and draft. Where's the draft at? It's like non-existent, isn't it? Now, what's interesting with that little Dwyer draft gauge is it's negative pressure only. So you could actually have positive pressure in that flue, and it will force that little white ball down to the bottom, so you won't see that. So it's kind of interesting there. If you take one set of readings, can you pick up this pattern? You'll miss it every single time. Guys, this is the most dangerous type of operation on fuel-fired equipment that we miss if we take one single set of readings. We miss this every time. You need multiple sets of readings. John. Okay, when you're setting up this test, do you do it from point of ignition and you have to reach steady state? We measure from the second it lights till the second it goes off. So John's question was, do we test at when it treats steady state or typically, you know, it's warmed up? Or do you let it continue to test the whole thing? We test the whole operation. We test the first 60 seconds of operation, which is light off. We test three readings during the run cycle. So that's usually from five minutes on. So five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes. And then we also test for 60 seconds after shutdown. Because what that tells us is also, is the gas valve seated? So if you see a rise in CO after a gas valve, after the equipment shuts off, the gas valve's leaking more than that 10% of lower explosive limits. You're actually seeing the raw fuel leak past the seats of the gas valve, converting to carbon monoxide as it comes into contact with that hot metal. Uh, what I've seen 100% of the time that I've seen rising CO on shutdown is that the gas line was done incorrectly. There was no sediment trap, no dirt leg. All that trash that's in the line is getting through the screen and into the valve and warping the seats. John. I, I asked that question intentionally because- Oh, I know you did. Yep. They don't do startup or shutdown. They take the readings, they, tend, they pull their analyzer, they log the data, and shut everything down. So that it was important that we understand their NCI's testing methodology yep. as opposed to some of the more popular. Excellent point. So you're, you're nailing. And that's, guys, to John's point, the industry teaches us to take one set of readings. And, that, and the guys are doing that. They're following code. They're trying to do the right thing. Most people don't do this you know, out of maliciousness or anything. It's just we don't know. So as we start to look at these situations and what's out there, I want you to look at the equipment just a little bit differently as you turn this on. So let's put times up there on that 40, 80, and 150. Let's just say that that's at five minutes, seven minutes, and 10 minutes. What, what do you see going on here? This is the first time. How many of you have seen rising CO and falling oxygen before? Has anybody seen that? Good, I've got some guys that have seen that. For those of you that haven't, what, what's wrong with that? Why is that a problem? Ah, we're depleting oxygen. If an analyzer could talk, somebody will invent this soon. If an analyzer could talk, if you see rising CO and falling oxygen, it's going to tell you that flue gases are backing up in the equipment and I'm running out of combustion air. That's what those readings are telling you. The flue gases are backing up in the heat exchanger. I'm running out of combustion air. Oxygen is not making it into the burner. And just imagine it talking like me. You'll never forget it. So with these readings, we have a combustion air problem. These are classic combustion air symptoms. So you discover this. What do you do now? Run. <laughs> Nate Adams, what do you do? I know what Nate's answer is going to be. Take it out. So, <laughs> put it in a heat pump. So, guys, we don't always have that option, do we? 
So we have to know how to fix these things. Now, as we start to go through the test results, we now add draft to this. We already took the reading previously. Draft is going to be 18 to 24 inches above the draft hood. And that's where you're looking for that 0.01 to 0.02 inches of water column range. If you're within that and you've got stable CO, less than 100 parts per million, and stable oxygen between 6 to 9%, you're good to go. But if you see rising CO falling oxygen with low draft, you got a problem. So the first thing we need to do is see what's interfering with the equipment. This is where we do a draft interference test. Number one, the equipment has to be safe. So we kick the equipment on, we're running it, and we're making sure that it's stable. First thing we got to do, everything is in normal position. This is a lot harder to do than it sounds like. Think about that water heater. If you're testing a water heater that's in a closet, the door is normally in what position? It's closed, right? How do we normally test them? Open. Oh, you can't do that. Hey, there's test instruments that are Bluetooth that do that. They'll help you. You're always monitoring the space. You're checking draft. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to kick on the biggest blower in the equipment or in the house, and typically that's going to be the furnace blower. The equipment has to run for a minimum of five minutes before you do this. Your draft should stabilize at that point. Kick the furnace blower on. If the furnace blower makes the draft drop, you've got return duct leakage, and you need to find it and fix it. The draft should never go down. So if you see that draft drop, you got an issue. Fix it. You also need to check the impact of the water heater if there's common vented with an 80% furnace. It will probably drive the ball down the first 60 seconds. It should recover and then start to take off as a result after that. But if your CO readings continue to climb for up to a minute, minute and a half, you got problems. Draft hasn't recovered, and you need to see what's going on. At no point should that ball go down. Start to kick on other exhaust fans. See what's happening. Any reduction in draft. Whenever you see the ball go down, that's the fan that's interfering with combustion air. Sometimes it's a combination, sometimes it's just one, like the blower in the furnace. But the draft readings are guiding you to what's interfering with your combustion problems. Now there's another symptom that can, it makes it look like a combustion air problem. You guys mentioned this one earlier. What if the flu's restricted? There's a simple step you can add to this. Walk over to the gas shutoff on the equipment after it's running, kill the gas cock. Just turn it off and watch the draft. If the draft all of a sudden, after about 15 seconds, shoots up, that flue is restricted because you're taking away the heat from that flue gas. It almost acts like a pressure relief. And you'll watch that ball in that draft gauge shoot up. That means you need to start looking at the flue sizing. And here's what's scary is when guys run into this and they see this on systems that they just installed a flue liner on. Flue liners are flex duct for flue gas. Do flex ducts move more air than hard pipe? No, the same principles apply to flue gases as well. So once you've seen that ball drop, you need to start taking some pressure measurements. This photo was taken a long time ago when I actually had color in my hair. Guys, you'll notice I got a micromanometer and I'm taking pressures of the room and I'm also taking them with reference to outside through pressure tubing. I'm seeing what's happening on the building side of the duct system. Basically, I am measuring static pressure on the building side of the duct system. I'm seeing what's going on there. So you've got to have some basic stuff. They've got it all across the hall in the booth there. You can see this stuff. On this one, I'm measuring negative 8.1. If you guys can't see that display, negative 8.1 pascals. Is that a good reading or a bad reading? It's horrible reading. Because that means that room is under what kind of pressure? It's negative, it's in a vacuum. How well is combustion air going to work in that room? It won't. Mechanical rooms should always be under a positive pressure. Now, let's wrap this up with how to fix it. Passive combustion air first. We've got high lows. Knowing what you guys know now about air side, how can we fix this? What's something that we could do? Fan powered's one. What if we're not going to put a fan in? What if we're just going to use the properties of air? 
that's going to go on one side. What if, what if, what if we used the density of air in our favor? Colder air does what? It drops. Hot air rises. What if we were to make some type of a trap on this? What if we put two sheet metal elbows back to back and we made a trap? What's that do to plumbing systems? It prevents, it prevents that stack effect, right? It prevents leakage. Make traps. You can actually do that on a sidewall grill by making a duct with the bottom blocked off and the top only opened. Isn't that interesting? Traps for combustion air. You can do the same thing on this installation. If that's a six inch duct that's going through the ceiling, two six inch elbows back to back. And you will seal that off and that will make a trap. You'll be amazed at how it'll change it because then it has to overcome that cold column of air and that gooseneck of that trap. What about a high-low? Mm. If it's a high-low, two L's back to back on the bottom, a four inch cap in the top one, because we're gonna make the equipment safe. It shouldn't need a secondary flu. Don't give it a chance to leak. And now we get the fan power. There are gonna be situations where the passive won't work and you need to bring in a fan. For boilers, bring in fan-powered combustion air that's interlocked with the equipment. When it kicks on, the fan in the can kicks on, brings air from the outside in, pressurizes that space. If you've got a furnace, you can actually use an intake. Field Controls makes a makeup air system that works great, brings the air in every time the furnace runs. There may be times you can't pressurize that space though. So instead of pumping air in, you have to suck the flue gases out. You'll run into this on old buildings, tall buildings, where you have to put the ducts on there, sidewall power venter. If you use one of these options, do not leave the draft hood on, because air takes the path of, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna suck through the burner compartment and go across the pressure drop of the heat exchanger, or will it short circuit up the hood? It'll go up the hood every time. So there's some other options, sealing duct leakage, relieving room pressures. So guys, here's what we talked about. We talked about the references, the influences. We talked about the installations, why they fail, how to test for it, and then how to fix it. So I went through the repairs kind of quick. I apologize for that, I lost track of time. So as we wrap this up, guys, testing's the right thing to do. We are the public's only hope when it comes to combustion safety. If we don't do it, nobody else will. So here's some steps. If you haven't written any down, start number one, measure an ambient CO. Check your own safety first. But find something that, from this presentation that you can actually take and that you can use to benefit your customers in the long term. Take a picture of this to get some ideas. So I'll skip the about NCI slide. If you want to know about it, come find me. That's all I got. Caleb, how'd I do? You did great, man. It was awesome. Okay, I'll make sure one, I was on time. One question that I'm getting a lot from the, uh, the live streamers. Um, Will you be making the slides available, the slide deck available for them to reference after they the fact? They should be available. Okay, great. Yep, they should be available. Awesome. So, question was from Mark, why is this not code? <laughs> that, that is... It's, and that's with simple. Guys, we got, a lot of, we got a lot of work to do. Some of these repairs are simple. I didn't even talk about barometric draft regulators. I'd have probably had booing and hissing if I'd mentioned those. There's other things though, when we start getting into draft hoods and those things, that when we look at why they were originally necessary, now there's things that make them obsolete. And it's kind of like, it goes back to why did grandma cut the ends off of the ham? And it's because she had a pan that was too short, but it gets passed down for generations. And we still use technology and stuff accessories that are absolutely dangerous when there's other alternatives that work better because we're afraid to accept change. Excellent question. Anyone else? Am I out of time, Caleb? Yeah, you got, you got about one minute. One minute, John Ellis. Uh, to answer his question real quick, why is this code? So uh, it, uh, the code for our tray has changed through the years with the introduction of herds. So, you know, tight ducts, delivery capacity, refrigerant charge, those went into code, 
But with that came third-party verification. Yeah. So if this stuff were to go into code, the only way to make sure that it's compliant would be to have somebody come in and test, quantify, and verify. Yeah. So that's why it's a slow shift to turn. It yep. should be code. Yeah. It should be. We're, we're talking health and safety, yeah. and, and we should actually have this code yeah. and have people trained to come and quantify and verify. So John says third-party testing is going to kind of help with this as far as becoming code. Let me address third-party testing real quick. Guys, why is third-party testing necessary right now in our industry? Why is it necessary? And I want to leave on this. It's because we don't do what we're supposed to do in the first place. If we did our jobs like we were supposed to, third-party testing would not be necessary. I'll leave you with that. Thank you all. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.